Chapter 7. Real Hope for Your Loved Ones Who Have Died Of What Does the Bible Really Teach? How do we know that the resurrection will really happen? How does Jehovah feel about resurrecting the dead? Who will be resurrected? Starting off, imagine that you are running away from a vicious enemy. He is much stronger and faster than you are. You know that he is merciless because you have seen him kill some of your friends. No matter how hard you try to outrun him, he keeps getting closer. There seems to be no hope. Suddenly, though, a rescuer appears at your side. He is far more powerful than your enemy, and he promises to help you. How relieved that makes you feel. In a sense, you are being pursued by such an enemy. All of us are. As we learned in the preceding chapter, the Bible calls death an enemy. None of us can outrun it or fight it off. Most of us have seen this enemy claim the lives of people dear to us. But Jehovah is far more powerful than death. He is the loving rescuer who has already shown that he can defeat this enemy. And he promises to destroy this enemy, death, once and for all. The Bible teaches, as the last enemy, death is to be brought to nothing. For 1 Corinthians 15:26. That is good news. Let us take a brief look at how the enemy death affects us when it strikes. Doing this will help us to appreciate something that will make us happy. You see, Job promises that the dead will live again. Isaiah 26:19. They will be brought back to life. That is the hope of the resurrection. So let's turn to Isaiah 26:19. Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26, 19. Isaiah 26. Isaiah 26 and 19. Your dead ones will live. A corpse of mine, they will rise up. Awake and cry out joyfully, you resonance in the dust. For you, for your, oh, I'm sorry, but this is a little hard to read from the camera. So let me just read it from the Bible. In the dust. For your dew is as the dew of mellows. And the earth itself will let even those impotent in death drop in birth. Sorry that the camera is a little blurry on these some of these words. But uh, back to paragraph. When a loved one dies, have you lost a loved one in death? The pain, the grief, and the feelings of helplessness can seem unbearable. At such times, we need to go to God's word for comfort. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 4. The Bible helps us to Understand how Jehovah and Jesus feel about death. Jesus, who perfectly, who perfectly reflected his father, knew the pain of losing someone in death. John 14, 9. When he was in Jerusalem, Jesus used to visit Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha, who lived in the nearby town of Bethany. They became close friends. The Bible says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. John 11, 5. As we learned in the preceding chapter, though, Lazarus died. So let's turn to 2 Corinthians 1, 3, 4. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Three and four. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
the Father of tender mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those in any sort of tribulation through the comfort with which we ourselves are being comforted by God. So now let's go to John 14.9. Fourteen and nine. Jesus said to him, "Have I been with you, men, so long as so long a time, and yet, Philip, you have not come to know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father also. How do you say, show us the Father?" John fourteen nine. Hmm. I feel like I didn't get that right. John fourteen nine. I was just reflecting that Jesus is like the Father. I guess that was yeah, that was the point. And now let's turn to John eleven five. John eleven five. John eleven. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. <clears throat> and now, moving on, how did Jesus feel about losing his friend? The account tells us that Jesus joined Lazarus, Lazarus' relatives, and friends as they grieved over the loss. Seeing them, Jesus was deeply moved. He groaned in the spirit and became troubled. Then the account says, Jesus gave way to tears. John 11, 33-35 Did Jesus' grief mean that he had no hope? Not at all. In fact, Jesus knew that something wonderful was about to happen. John 11, 34 Still, he felt the pain and sorrow that death brings. So let's turn to John eleven three four, and we were just there, and we closed it. John eleven, John eleven three and four. Therefore, his sisters dispatched word to him, saying, "Lord, see, the one for whom you have affection is sick." But when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not with death as its object, but is for the glory of God, in order that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So now, back to the paragraph. In a way, Jesus' grief is encouraging to us. It teaches... It teaches us that Jesus and his father, Jehovah, hate death. But Jehovah God is able to fight and overcome the, that enemy. Let us see what God enabled Jesus to do. Lazarus, come on out. Lazarus had been buried in a cave. And Jesus asked that the stone sealing its entrance be taken away. Martha objected because after four days, Lazarus' body must have begun, begun to decay. John eleven thirty nine. From a human standpoint, what hope was there? So let's turn to John eleven thirty nine. John eleven, and we're already there. John eleven thirty nine. Jesus said, "Take the stone away." Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, "Lord, by now he must smell, for it is four days." Now, <clears throat> back to the paragraph. The stone was rolled away, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come on out. What happened? The man that had been dead came out. John eleven forty three forty four. Can you imagine the joy of the people there? 
whether Lazarus was their brother, relative, friend, or neighbor, they knew that he had died, yet here he was, the same dear man, standing among them again? That must have seemed too good to be true. Many no doubt embraced Lazarus joyfully. What a victory over death! So let's turn to John 11, 43-44. John 11, 43 44. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come on out. The man that had been dead came out with his feet and hands bound with wrappings, and his counter countenance, countenance was bound about with a cloth. She so said to them, Loose him and let him go. So now, Moving on, and before we go on, let's see the picture illustration. Elijah resurrected a widow's son, 1 Kings 17, 17 through 24. The apostle Peter resurrected the Christian woman Dorcas, Acts 9, 36 through 42. The resurrection of Lazarus resulted in great joy in John eleven, thirty eight through forty four. All right. So back to the paragraph. Just not claiming to perform this amazing miracle on his own, in his prayer just before calling out to Lazarus. He made it clear that Jehovah was the source of the resurrection. John 11, 41-42 This was not the only time that Jehovah used his power in this way. The resurrection of Lazarus is just one of, one of nine miracles of this kind recorded in God's word. To read and study these accounts is a, is a delight. They teach us that God is not partial. For the resurrected ones include young and old, male and female, Israelite and non-Israelite. And what joy is described in these passages? For example, when Jesus raised a young girl from the dead, her parents were beside themselves with great ecstasy. Mark 5:42. Yes, Jehovah had given them a cause for joy that they would never forget. So, let's take a look at John 11:41-42. In John eleven forty one and forty two. Therefore they took the stone away. Therefore they took the stone away. Now Jesus raised his eyes heavenward and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. True, I knew that you always hear me, but on account of the crowd standing around. I spoke in order that they might believe that you sent me forth. And let's see. <clears throat> Moving on. Of course, those resurrected by Jesus eventually died again. Does this mean that it was pointless to resurrect them? Not at all. These Bible accounts confirm important truths and give us hope. Learning from the Resurrection Accounts The Bible teaches that the dead are conscious of nothing at all. They are not alive and have no conscious existence anywhere. The account of Lazarus confirms this. Upon returning to life, did Lazarus throw people with descriptions of heaven? Or did he terrify them with horrible tales about a burning hell? No. The Bible contains no such words from Lazarus. During the four days that he was dead, he had been conscious of nothing at all. Ecclesiastes 9.5 Lazarus has simply been sleeping in death. John 11.11 11. The account of Lazarus also teaches us that the resurrection is a reality 
Not a mere myth. Jesus raised Lazarus in front of a crowd of eyewitnesses. Even the religious leaders who hated Jesus did not deny this miracle. Rather, they said, What are we to do? Because this man, Jesus, performs many signs. John 11:47. Many people went to see the resurrected man. As a result, even more of them put faith in Jesus. They saw in Lazarus living proof that Jesus was sent by God. This evidence was so powerful that some of the hard-hearted Jewish religious leaders planned to kill both Jesus and Lazarus. So let's take a look at John 11, 47. <clears throat> Consequently, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered to I mean, gathered the Senate Sanhedrin together and began to say, What are we to do? Because this man performs many signs. So now let's take a look at um, John 11, 53. John 11, 53. Therefore, from that day on, they took counsel to kill him. And let's take a look at 12, 9 through 11. 12, 9 through 11. 12, 9 through 11. Therefore, a great crowd of the Jews got to know he was there, and they came, not on account of Jesus only, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised up from the dead. The chief priest now took counsel to kill Lazarus also, because on account of how many of the Jews were going there and putting faith in Jesus. So, back to the paragraph. Is it unrealistic to accept the resurrection as a fact? No, for Jesus taught that someday all those in the memorial tombs will be resurrected. John 5, 28. Joe is the creator of all life. Should it be hard to believe that he can recreate life? Of course. Much would depend on Jehovah's memory. Can he remember our dead loved ones? Countless trillions of stars fill the universe, yet God gives the name of each one. Isaiah 40, 26. So Jehovah God can remember our dead loved ones in every detail, and he is, all, and he is ready to restore them to life. So let's turn to Isaiah 40.26. Isaiah 40.26. Raise your eyes high up and see who has created these things. It is the one who is bringing forth the army of them even by number, all of whom he calls even by name. Due to the abundance of dynamic energy, he also being vigorous in power, not one of them is missing. Hmm. So now, back to the paragraphs. We're at 14, I believe. How, though, does Jehovah feel about resurrecting the dead? The Bible teaches that he is eager to raise the dead. The faithful man Job asks, If an able-bodied man dies, can he live again? Job was speaking about waiting in the grave until the time came for God to remember him. He said to Jehovah, You will call, and I myself shall answer you. For the work of your hands, you will have a yearning. Taken from Job 14, 13 through 15. Just think, Jehovah actually yearns to bring the dead back to life. Is it not heartwarming to learn that Jehovah feels that way? But what about this future resurrection? Who will be resurrected and where? So, all those in the memorial tombs, the Bible's resurrection accounts teach us much.
about the resurrection to come. People who were restored to life right here on earth were reunited with their loved ones. The future resurrection will be similar, but much better. As we learn in chapter 3, God's purpose is that the whole earth be made into a paradise. So the dead will not be raised to life in a world filled with war, crime, and sickness. They will have an opportunity to live forever on this earth in peaceful and happy conditions. Who will be resurrected? Jesus said that all those in the mortal tombs will hear his, Jesus' voice and come out. John 5, 28, 29. Similarly, Revelation 20, 13 says, The sea gave up those dead in it, and death and Hades gave up those dead in them. Hades refers to the common grave of mankind. See the appendix, pages 2, 12 through 13. This collective grave will be t emptied. All those billions who rest there will live again. The Apostle Paul said, There is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. Acts 24.15 What does that mean? <clears throat> the righteous include many of the people we read about in the Bible who lived before Jesus came to the earth. You might think of Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Moses, Ruth, Esther, and many others. Some of these men and women of faith are discussed in the 11th chapter of Hebrews. But the righteous also include Jehovah's servants who die in our time. Thanks to the resurrection hope, we may be freed from any dread of dying. Hebrews 2.15 so let's turn to Hebrews 2.15. Hebrews 2.15. And that he might emancipate all those who for fear of death were subject to slavery all through their lives. Alright, back to the paragraph. What about all the people who did not serve or obey Job because they never knew about him? These billions of unrighteous ones will not be forgotten. They too will be resurrected and given time to learn about the true God and to serve Him. During a period of a thousand years, the dead will be resurrected and given an opportunity to join faithful humans on earth in serving Jehovah. It will be a wonderful time. This period is what the Bible refers to as Judgment Day. <coughs> Excuse me. Feeling a little sick here. Moving on, though. To uh, let's see our little footnote. Okay. Does this mean that every human who ever lived will be resurrected? No. The Bible says that some of the dead are in Gehenna. Luke 12:5. Gehenna got its name from a garbage dump located outside of ancient Jerusalem. Dead bodies and garbage were burned there. The dead whose bodies were thrown there were considered by the Jews to be unworthy of a burial and a resurrection. So Gehenna is a fitting symbol of everlasting destruction. Although Jesus will have a role in judging the living and the dead, Job is the final judge. Acts 10.42 He will never resurrect those whom he judged to be wicked and unwilling to change. Let's turn to Acts 10, 42. <coughs> Acts 10, 42. Also, he ordered us to preach to the people and to give a thorough witness that this is the one decreed by God to be judged of the living 
and the dead. <clears throat> Moving on, the heavenly resurrection. The Bible also refers to another kind of resurrection, one to life as a spirit creature in heaven. Only one example of this type of resurrection is recorded in the Bible, that of Jesus Christ. After Jesus was put to death as a human, Job did not allow his faithful son to remain in the grave. Psalm 16:10, Acts 13, 34, 35. God resurrected Jesus, but not as a human. The Apostle Peter explains that Christ was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 1 Peter 3:18. This was a great miracle. Jesus was alive at was alive again as a mighty spirit person. 1 Corinthians 15:3-6. Jesus was the first ever to receive this glorious type of resurrection. John 3:13. But he would not be the last. Hmm. So let's turn to Psalm 16:10. <clears throat> Psalm 1610. Psalm 16. Psalm 16.10. For you will not leave my soul in shield. You will not allow your loyal one to see the pit. And let's see. Let's also see First Peter three eighteen. If I could find it, First Peter. I know it's somewhere in the back of the book. Oh, there we go. I just saw it. It was First Peter three eighteen. <clears throat> First Peter three eighteen. Why even Christ died once for all time concerning sins? a righteous person for unrighteous ones, that he might lead you to God, he being put to death in the flesh, but being made alive in the spirit. So let's also see 1 Corinthians 15, 3-6. First Corinthians fifteen three through six. And more likely I just passed it at the time. Fifteen fifteen three through six. For I handed on to you among the first things that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, yes, that he has been raised up the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that he appeared to upward of five hundred brothers at one time, the most of whom remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep in death. Hmm. And now, let us turn to John 3.13.
John 3.13. I know you're going to like hardly read this, so that's why I'm definitely reading it out loud. <clears throat> Moreover, no man has ascended into heaven, but he that descended from heaven, the Son of Man. So that was John 3.13. All right. <clears throat> Back to the paragraphs. Knowing that he was soon returned to heaven, Jesus told his faithful followers that he would prepare a place for them there. John 14, 2. Jesus referred to those going to heaven as his little flock. Luke 12, 32. How many are to be in this relatively small group of faithful Christians? According to Revelation 14, 1, the Apostle John says, I saw and look, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, standing upon the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. Hmm. These a hundred and forty-four thousand Christians, including Jesus' faithful apostles, are raised to life in heaven. When does their resurrection take place? The Apostle Paul wrote that it would occur during the time of Christ's presence. 1 Corinthians 15.23 As you will learn in chapter 9, we are now living in that time. So those few remaining ones of the 144,000 who die in our day are instantly resurrected to life in heaven. 1 Corinthians 15.51-55 The vast majority of mankind, however, have the prospect of being resurrected in the future to life in paradise on earth. So let us turn to Yeah, let's first turn to 1 Corinthians 15:23. First Corinthians First Corinthians First Corinthians fifteen twenty three. Fifteen twenty three. But each one in his own rank, Christ of first fruits, afterward those who belong to the Christ during his presence. So now let us turn to first Corinthians fifteen fifty one through fifty five. 51 through 55. Look, I tell you a secret secret. We shall not all fall asleep in death, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, during the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised up incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And that was through 55. For this which is corruptible must be put on incorruption, and this which is mortal must be put on immortality. But when this which is corruptible puts on incorruption, and this which is mortal puts on immortality, then the same will take place that is written, Death is swallowed up forever. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? Hmm. So, our last paragraph. Yes, Jehovah really will defeat our enemy death, and it will be gone forever. Isaiah 25, 8. Yet you may wonder, what would those resurrected to heaven do there? They will from part of a... They will form part of a marvelous kingdom government in heaven. Will we learn more about that government in the next? We will learn more about that government in the next chapter. So, let's turn to Isaiah 25:8. Isaiah 25:8. 
25-8. Isaiah. Isaiah 25-8. Isaiah 25-8. He will actually swallow up death forever. And the Sovereign Lord Joel will certainly wipe the tears from all faces. And in the reproach of his people, he will. Take away from all the earth, for Jehovah himself has spoken it. So now, <clears throat> we have a picture illustration. In paradise, the dead will rise and be reunited with their loved ones. If you have anyone dead that you know of, I'm pretty sure this is something that you can look forward to. And now, our box. What the Bible teaches. The Bible's resurrection accounts give us a sure hope. In John 11, 39-44. Job was eager to bring the dead back to life. Job 14, 13 through 15. All those in the common grave of mankind will be resurrected. John 5, 28, 29. All right, and that concludes chapter 7. So now, our concluding questions for YouTube purposes will be these three bolded questions. Please answer these questions right here. How do we know that the resurrection will really happen? How does Jehovah feel about resurrecting the dead? Who will be resurrected? So, if you feel like you know the answers or you know the answers, Please leave those in the comment section under the video. And stay tuned for Chapter 8. What is God's Kingdom? We'll be covering that in the next video. So, if you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe so that you can stay tuned for more chapters of this book of... What does the Bible really teach? Thank you for watching Chapter 7, and hopefully you are all caught up so far, because we went over, I'm making quite a lot of progress right now, but there's still very much to go. I mean, there's still a lot more, should I say, there's still a lot more to go. There's all the way up to 19 <laughs> and we're going to cover a little bit of the appendix so we're at chapter 7 yeah there's a lot more to go <laughs> so stay tuned alright this is Eric signing off